Good morning, Mr. Ford. Good morning, Mr. Thanks Patrick. for coming down. I know you've got a lot on your busy schedule, but I wanted you to come down to meet some of our best and brightest. So before we get started, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves to Mr. Ford. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to meet you, Kevin. Hi, my name's Antasia. Nice to meet you, ma'am. I'm Shad. Uh, no, you're not. I can tell by that smile. <laughs> JT. Hi, JT. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. All right. Okay, Mr. Ford, the reason I asked you here to come here and talk with some of our best and brightest is because, as you know, more than anybody, over the past couple of years, Ryle High School and Boone County Schools in general have had an incline of what we call Tier 3 violations across yes. our student body. Yes, and as we as an administration have been talking with kids about the, this epidemic, we realize that not all of our kids are as informed about what Tier 3s are and the consequences are as they probably should be, so we wanted to do something to educate all all the students in Boone County if possible. Fantastic, great, fantastic. I applaud each and every one of you for wanting to do this project. This is great. This so is great. that being said, because we, we, we didn't want to waste your time, we did some planning before you got here, I asked each of these guys to come up with a question or two revolving around what we just talked about, tier three violations and the consequences of, and you know, education for families to prevent these things from happening. And I'm gonna just kind of let them go around and ask you a few questions if that's okay. That is fantastic. I'm happy to be here and very proud to be here. Thank y'all very much for having me. All right, Mr. Ford, my first question is going to be, what constitutes a Tier 3 hearing with the superintendent? All right, that's a great place to start. In our Code of Conduct book that is adopted by the Board of Education, we establish the rules, guidelines, and responsibilities for our students in the school district. Every year at the start of the school year, your teachers and administrators here, I know, in your class meetings, they go over the Code of Conduct book with you. Am I right? Okay. In that Code of Conduct book, we establish three different levels of rules. <clears throat> okay? Mm -hmm. Tier 1 is our least. Tier 2 is in the middle. Tier 3 are our most serious offenses. And those Tier 3 offenses generate around a drug issue, an alcohol issue, a student who brings a weapon to school, or a student who commits an act of extreme violence or makes a threat of extreme violence, either at school, at a school event, or even on a school bus. When a student violates one of those tier three offenses, it's mandatory that that student be removed from school for safety reasons, and then they have to come before me with the administration from the school I serve under Dr. Poe's delegation, who is our superintendent, to serve as superintendent in regards to the student behavior. I hear the case. That's the hearing that you've heard about. I actually hear the case, the information provided by the school, and I question the student, and then I make a decision as far as is there going to be any additional punishment besides that original suspension or removal from school, in that hearing. So that's what a tier three hearing is. Okay. All right, my question is, what are the possible consequences for a student that comes to a tier three hearing? All right, very good. And that's perfect because that feeds right off the first question. When a student comes before me for a tier three hearing, I look at the evidence provided by the school from their investigation and finding, and I question the student about their involvement in the incident. Then I also look at the student's attendance record for the school year, their academic record for the year, and their behavior record. From all that information, I make a decision, and it's real simple. Can this student go back to their home school? And that truly is the question that I ask myself while I'm sitting in this hearing, listening to the student talk to me. Many times, the parents or guardians of the student are there with me. Sometimes they have the information that they provide because things are going on at home or in the student's life outside of school. So I listen to that information as well. With all that information, if I allow the student to go back to their home school, I put them back at school on what's called probation. And that probation is non-negotiable. I set the terms for the student's probation with me. That probation usually circles around academics. The student must pass their classes. 
or I order the student into summer school or some kind of credit recovery program. The student must attend school. They're not allowed to have unexcused absences or tardies to school. And when a student comes before me for a hearing, they can't use parent notes for the rest of that year. They have to have legal or doctor's notes. I also focus on their behavior. The student cannot get written up for anything. And then sometimes I add other items to the probation, like I order the student to be involved with Drug Free Club of America. Like I just said a moment ago, I order the student that if they're not passing classes or if they have not passed a class, I order them into summer school or a credit recovery program. So sometimes I add in additional items to the probation from resources that are available to me because I want the student to work through whatever the issue is that got the student in trouble. That's called probation. Option number two, I put the student at the alternative school. At the alternative school, we have counseling programs and we have academic programs. So the student gets to continue with their, their schoolwork, but they also receive counseling through an IOP program or a social coping counseling program or an anger management counseling program. I place students at the alternative school if I can't trust their behavior in our large comprehensive schools, any of our main high schools or our middle schools. The most serious consequence, and the third option that I have, is to continue the student's suspension for a period of time until that student meets with our elected Board of Education. And in that case, the student could be looking at expulsion from school for up to one calendar year. And of course, expulsion means you don't get an education in our school district unless the board declares as part of that expulsion that we have to provide some kind of virtual services to the student. In the cases where the, students, the student goes to the alternative school or expulsion, that student's no longer allowed to be involved in any activities at their school. For example, I understand that each of you is a senior this year at Royal High School, correct? Yeah. You have a very special event that's coming up called the Senior Dinner Dance. Am I right? Mm -hmm. When I was an assistant principal at Ryle, that was for me one of the greatest moments because it was the faculty, the staff, administration, and the seniors. And it was a very enjoyable evening. Any student who's assigned to the alternative school or facing expulsion, they wouldn't be allowed to participate in that event. They can't go to ball games. They can't be a part of clubs or organizations at the school. And if their punishment is serious enough to where their placement at the alternative school is all the way to the end of the year, they don't get to participate in the graduation ceremony. If they finish their academic work, they get their diploma. That's a state law. But participation in the actual commencement or graduation ceremony, that's a privilege. And that can be taken away. It's a very difficult meeting for me to have to come to a conclusion of alternative school or move for expulsion. Because I know what that student is going to lose as far as the privileges that they had at their home school. But it simply comes down to, when I think about consequences, I have to make an evaluation. Do I trust this student to go back to their home school and correct this behavior? If I can't trust that student, I can't put them back. And therefore, I look at the other two consequences that are more severe. Good question. Uh, what does it mean for a student to be assigned to A's for behavior reasons? Okay. When a student comes before me through a Tier 3 hearing, like I said a moment ago, if I don't trust that student to go back to their home school and correct the behavior that brought them before me, I do have the authority to place a student at the alternative school, or A's, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, 
for the rest of the school year. Sometimes it carries over to the next school year. When that student is assigned to ACE by me for a behavior reason, at their home school, they lose all their privileges. Like for example, here we are on the stage and obviously there's some work being done to create a play that's going to be put on here at Rock. If a student came before me and they had been involved in the production of the plays that being worked on here, mm -hmm. if I had to move them to the alternative school, they would not allow to be able to participate in that activity any longer. That goes for any club, any organization, any athletic team. They lose their privileges to participate until they are released from ACE and transitioned back to their home school. The other thing is this. They're not allowed to be on any school campus while they are assigned to ACE. So, for example, if a student has a sister who is up for homecoming queen at either a football homecoming or a basketball homecoming, that student who's assigned to ACE would not be allowed to go to the school site and watch his sister or her sister go through the announcement of the homecoming court and all the activities that go on with that event because they're not allowed on school property. So not only can they not participate in any event, they can't be on any school property. So they miss out on other events that they may want to be a part of for some other reason, like the example I just gave you. It's a very strict placement at ACE. Students are searched every day to ensure that there's no contraband coming into the facility. It's a very small environment. Um, it's very regimented when students um, not only go to lunch, but how they go to lunch, how they sit, how they go back to their classes after lunch. Um, it's it's, it does, ACE does not offer the freedoms and the privileges mm -hmm. that being in your comprehensive home school like Ryle allows. So that's what it's like to go to ACE. You lose out on every opportunity that you would have at your home school. You cannot be on any other school property within our district during the time that you're assigned to ACE so you miss out on activities there and the structure of the program is very regimented. It does not offer the freedoms, does not offer the privileges like being in your home school environment does. So Mr. Ford, my question is, when a student comes before you to hearing and they get a punishment, how long does that last or carry over? Good question, good question. When a student comes before me and I make a decision for either probation, placement at the alternative school, talk about those two first, okay? Because those are my decisions. If I place a student on probation, normally that probation is for the remainder of the current school year. Now, summer school is part of the current school year. So, if a student is not being successful in the class, and I tell that student, you have to go to summer school as part of your probation, then the same terms of the probation are still in place while the student is going through summer school to finish whatever class that they need to, okay? So probation usually lasts for the remainder of the school year. Now, placement at the alternative school, that's a little different. Some placements at the alternative school are for the remainder of the school year. We have counseling programs at the alternative school that sometimes I order a student into while they're at the alternative school doing their academic work. Those counseling programs 
like our intensive outpatient program for adolescent substance abuse, those will wrap up by the end of the school year. So if a student is academically successful while they're there and they complete the counseling program, then normally I will let them go back to school at the start of the next school year and try it again. I gotta say this, however, there are circumstances that come into play where if I deem through the hearing that a student is a safety risk, I have placed students at the alternative school for up to one calendar year. That authority has been provided to me by the superintendent and the Board of Education. So if it's a very serious issue or an issue that's ongoing, the students come before me multiple times, for example, for the same behavior problem, I may place that student at the alternative school for up to a year. And then I look at where's the semester break. So if a student comes to me in February and I say that you're going to be there, carry it over to next year, usually that means we're going to reevaluate at the end of the first semester to see if the student returns in January. I'm not going to make them wait till February and come back in the middle of the semester. But it's a long period of time. So probation is usually for the rest of the school year. Placement at the alternative school can be for the rest of the school year, or it can carry over to the next school year. And students have to remember, if that placement at the alternative school carries over to the next school year, they're not eligible to participate in any programs, athletics, club organizations until they return to their school. So that could go into another year for them. Now expulsion, that's up to the Board of Education. Only the Board of Education, which is our elected board that governs the school system, they are the only body that can truly expel a student under Kentucky law, and they can expel a student up to one calendar year, which means if they have a hearing with a student in March and they expel a student for their behavior because it's so threatening to the safety of the school environment, they can expel that student for a calendar year, which would be to the next March. We wouldn't be looking at quarter breaks or semester breaks the next year. It truly is one calendar year, but again, that's up to the Board of Education, and only the Board has that authority, okay? Because the difference between me placing a student at the alternative school, we're still providing educational services. If the Board rules to expel a student, they can do so and say, you're out of our school system, and we're not gonna do any services. And they can do that up to one year, but that's for them, okay? Good question. All right, Mr. Floyd, I know what can happen as a consequence of us coming to you for a Tier 3 hearing. Is there anything else that the school can do? Good question. Good question. In the cases that you're talking about, I don't have the authority to order the schools to do additional punishments uh, beyond what happens when a student comes before me. But I do know that at some of our schools, the following things happen. And these are up to the school, okay? Uh, for example, I know at several of my high schools, when a student comes to me for a tier three hearing, if they have a permit to park on campus or drive to school, they lose their driving privileges. I know that's happened, okay? Um, I know that in some of our high schools, that if I place a student back at school, even on probation, they're not allowed to participate in extracurricular activities or events, okay? Um, and that's up to the school. And I tell students a lot of times when they come before me in a hearing, I understand you're involved in, I'm gonna say basketball, because it's basketball season, and I was a basketball coach for 30 years. So I would say to the student, I understand you're involved in playing basketball. I'm not gonna stop you from playing basketball. That's up to the school, the athletic director, the coach, that's up to them. And I'll tell the student, the school is waiting to see what I'm gonna do with you. And then they take the action that they have adopted through their site-based counsel. 
But I do know that it happens. Students, I send students back to school on probation, but they're still not allowed to participate in activities under the school rules, okay? I know that um, if the student comes before me and there was some issue with inappropriate technology usage as part of the issue, students aren't allowed to have cell phones at school. Now, our code of conduct book says that students are allowed to have cell phones unless that privilege is removed. And I do know that some of my high schools and middle schools will disallow a student to bring cell phones or be in possession of a cell phone at school. And I've even had some students who have lost computer privileges at their school as part of the school rules when I send the student back on probation, okay? So there are additional consequences that the schools will adopt through their site-based counsel as part of their student behavior policy, and that's perfectly acceptable. It's within state law that they can do that at the school level. So to answer your question with a long answer to a short question, yes, there are additional consequences that the school can levy that has nothing to do with me, okay? And that those consequences have been adopted through the school policies and procedures. And that does happen in many cases. Good question. Okay, I've given y'all a lot of information and you have asked some great questions. And I'm just curious, from the conversation that we've been having, have there been any additional questions that have come to y'all's mind? Any, anything you want to ask? Okay. When someone Good gets for. expelled and like say they can't go to another school or get homeschooled, do they just like miss out on school for that entire year? Under the Kentucky state laws for expulsion, the answer to that question is yes. When a student is expelled, that student is no longer allowed to attend school within the school district that expelled the student. Now I will say that sometimes the Board of Education can rule to expel a student but provide educational services. When that happens, we put the student on a virtual educational program and they do their work at home or wherever they can get internet access, sometimes the library for example, and they can continue to do their academic work, but they are banned from all other activities and they're not allowed to be on school property. When a student is expelled, whether it's without services or with services, in Kentucky, no public school system is going to honor that child to enroll in their schools. There have been cases where students have come to Boone County School District from other school districts and I've had to notify the parents, your child cannot enroll in our schools because your child was expelled in another school district. There have even been cases where children have come to us from Indiana and Ohio because they were expelled in those states. And we, would, we do not allow the child to enroll in our school system because the state laws are very clearly stated that the school district can and will honor an expulsion. So, unless the parent can provide a homeschool setting, unless the parent can enroll the child in a private school that will accept the child, or the parent can take the child to another state where the child will be allowed to enroll, if the child's expelled from a school system in Kentucky, no public school system in Kentucky is going to allow that child to enroll until that expulsion expires. I'm going to use a really strong phrase. In public education, we call expulsion the educational death penalty. And a child misses out or could miss out on an entire year of school. Good question. Are there any others? Any other questions that y'all have that, from the discussions we've been having? I do have one. Um, yes, ma'am. We've been talking a lot about consequences, but before the child gets to the point to where they want to 
like behave badly, what are some ways that they could get help? Again, that, that may be the best question. And I, and, and I say that because I don't like to do hearings. I really don't. I get no thrill out of it. I've been doing hearings for over 13 years. I've been in my current job for 15 years. My staff and I recently did a count and I've done over 3,000 hearings in my tenure as the Director of People Personnel for the Benton County School System. And I don't like doing them. Too many times the situation is negative and results in people being upset because I have to change their placement or I have to make them do things like go to summer school and they don't want to do that. It's, it's really never a really good setting. So I try to make it the best that I can when a student comes before me and we talk about overcoming the behaviors, okay? But what I would like to see is exactly what y'all are doing right now. Is there anything that can be done to curb a student from breaking a rule that could result in coming to me? Ladies and gentlemen, you're doing it right now educating the students at Ryle High School. I am so proud of each of you for coming up with this plan because I know when Mr. Pastor first approached me about doing this project, he told me, Mr. Ford, we got students at Ryle who need information. They want information. They want the students to be educated. They know that there are problems in the school and the kids don't know what's going to happen to them if they break certain rules. So the kids want to do something to educate the student body. That's what Mr. Pastor told me. I come into Ryle, he's got four excellent students who want to look out for their friends, their classmates, the underclassmen coming after them. You're doing exactly what you just asked. Education is the key. We need to make students aware. If you've got a problem, go to your counselor, go to your teachers, go to an administrator. Tell them, I've got a problem. I need help. There are an abundance of resources that are available to help students overcome battles with what I call demons that result in them getting in severe trouble. Okay? There's an abundance of resources. But the most important thing that we can do is what you're doing right here. You're asking questions, getting answers to educate your friends, your classmates, and like I said, those students coming behind you to make them aware. Hey folks, if you bring a dab pen with liquid THC into the school, that's a drug issue. You get busted, you're going to Mr. Ford. If you go to Mr. Ford, these are the things that could happen to you depending on the severity. Don't do it because you'll lose out on privileges, you'll lose out on opportunities, and you could lose out on an entire year of school if the punishment is severe enough that it goes all the way up the ladder to expulsion. So you're doing what I love and hope that our other high schools will feed off of. Educate the students. Make them aware. Give them something to think about. So before, before they bring that pocket knife to school, before they smoke that dab pen on the way to school, before they drink at that party, before they go to the senior dinner dance or go to prom, you've given them something to think about. If they get caught, these are the things that could happen to you. So don't do it. You just answered your question by what we've been sitting here doing for the past half hour or so. And I applaud each one of you as senior leaders in your school 
wanting to educate the student body and help clean up some of the things that are going on right here in your school. This is your school. And y'all are doing a great thing by putting this video together and educating the other students here at the school. You answered your question, and I congratulate y'all. Good job, everybody. Great job.